Well, welcome all to a Houston Tuesday Musical Club meeting. Uh, today, I'm Roy Wiley, and I, along with uh, Susan Fishman and Susie Marion, are acting presidents this year of the Tuesday Musical Club. We're so glad that you are here with us. Um, I think I will type the uh, address of our website and chat, so you'll have that if you want to check on the website and see other things that we're doing. A big thing we just had was our K-Hand competition for child piano prodigies. And I've asked Susie Marion, who was in charge of that, to say a little bit at the end of the program about that. Um, that's um, welcome to you here. We thank Debbie and Gail so much for helping us, not only with the speakers, but with the technological issues and we've all learned a lot this year and we've had wonderful people from all over talking to us. So it's been a great boon for us. So I'll turn the show back over to Debbie. Our theme this year is personal stories. And I've heard so many stories from members of the symphony about the experience of getting through the pandemic. The symphony in Houston is one of the very few that kept going with the season this year. And we are very fortunate to have the CEO, John Mangum, the personnel manager whose life I'm sure was turned upside down this year, Michael Gorman, and four musicians, Martha Chapman, who's a violinist, Brad White, trombonist, uh, Nancy Goodrell in the French horn section, and Kate Ladner, the piccolo player. And a couple of our musicians participated in the aerosol studies. So we'll hear a lot about how the symphony logistically played this year they're doing a fabulous job both online and now with live concerts. I would like to start with John Mangum, if you could just give an overview of going from the time you heard there was going to be a pandemic uh, to how you uh, dismounted and regrouped and proceeded from smaller concerts to larger ones. Yeah, thanks very much, Debbie. Um, it's great to be with you all today. And uh, yeah, it's a long story, so I'll just give the, the highlights. Um, you know, we found out on March 13th of last year that we would need to cancel our concerts. So we were we were almost through our 2020 or 2019, 2020 season at that point. And uh, we, we canceled those those performances. It was a, an oratorio by by uh, John Adams called El Nino that featured the chorus and the orchestra and six soloists. Um, and, uh, you know, canceled uh, before the dress rehearsal of, of the, the performance that week. Um, it quickly became apparent, I think it was the following Monday, that the two month sort of uh, uh, order was put in place by Harris County that, that uh, you know, everything was closed through, I think it was May 10th, something like that. It was an eight week order. And it became apparent that we were going to have to think about, you know, uh, pivoting to doing more activity, you know, to doing activity online because that was all that was available to us. Um, in terms of how we got back to performing uh, live, it was with the help of a lot of partners. Debbie mentioned the Center for Performing Arts Medicine at Houston Methodist. Um, <clears throat> we also worked very closely with the Houston Health Department and with the City of Houston and with Houston First, which is a nonprofit that's a subsidiary of the city that manages the venues in the theater district, including Jones Hall. So, um, you know, we had a lot of partners that, and, and our attorneys at Baker Botts, um, we had a lot of partners and we had a lot of expertise to draw on as we mapped out a kind of a safe reopening plan. And uh, that started with a concert that we did on July 4th, uh, Freedom Over Texas. Uh, kind of 4th of July program that was, there, there was no audience, it was just for television. Now kind of simultaneous with, with all this, we had a couple of other things going on. So we, we did, you know, we moved from musician produced videos and a few smaller things to uh, Friday night recitals from people's living rooms that we called the living room series. And that ran through May and June. Um, and then also we have a board member, the Dean of the Shepherd School at Rice, Bob Yakovich is on our board. And I reached out to Bob pretty early on and said, you know, we need to make sure that it's safe for us to have the musicians together. So that's the aerosol study that Debbie's referenced a few times. Um, and we worked with the Shepherd School and with the uh, 
oh, I can't remember whose name is on it, but the somebody school of engineering at Rice um, <laughs> to, to do this uh, study. And it used high speed photography and a kind of pixelated background to uh, measure the, the aerosols coming out around the mouth and around the bell of wind and brass instruments. We also did string player for control. And I know um, Catherine who's on this meeting was part of that uh, study. And, and also uh, Nancy may have participated as well. So uh, they can talk to you more about the specifics of that, but we got preliminary recommendations from Rice that had to do with how far apart people needed to sit on stage. So that's the distancing that we're using on stage. Uh, how many times the air needed to change over in Jones Hall in an hour for the, the environment to be safe for musicians and audience, what kind of filters we needed to use in our air handling system, and uh, another recommendation about using UVC lighting uh, as an as a additional prophylactic measure. So, um, you know, that kind of unfolded and that helped us also get back on stage. And, and so we started with that 4th of July concert. We did some smaller ensemble concerts in July and into August. And in August, we also started to include bigger symphonies. I think we had a late Mozart symphony and early Schubert symphony on the program in August. And uh, we've just kind of proceeded that way through the season. Um, at, at this point, other than the week that we had to cancel because of the freeze, um, we're the only orchestra that I really know of uh, that has had a full subscription season with some kind of audience at each concert. So we're doing three concerts a weekend and we tend to have between 300 and 400 people at each of the concerts. Um, we're also live streaming every Saturday night for the people that don't feel comfortable coming to Jones Hall. And that reaches at least 500 households a week. So we, we look at that as being about a thousand viewers, uh, people listening from home. So that's just kind of a really high level overview of, of what, we've, what we've done. And you know, it was, it was the ability to partner with the city, the ability to partner with Rice, with Houston Methodist, to get good medical and legal advice. Um, you know, we've been able to do this in a way that uh, has been safe for all concerned. We haven't identified any community spread among our orchestra or our audience. Um, we regularly test the musicians and there's all kinds of safety measures backstage that I think would be more interesting to hear from them about uh, than, than from me. But, uh, you, you know, it is a different environment, but everybody has really risen to the challenge. And, and I've been, you know, deeply impressed with, with what the organization has been able to do and what our community has been able to, been willing to support through all this. So... Uh, one question I have is uh, finding conductors and programs. Is there still someone on staff who's doing all of that or are you involved? And I've also heard from your talks that some of the pieces are suggested by the musicians themselves. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it, it's almost impossible to get international conductors here because of all the travel restrictions going every which way. Um, We've had a couple of conductors come because they were able to secure what's called a national interest exemption. In other words, we could prove it was in the interest of the United States for us to be able to bring them here. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's very challenging to get uh, uh, conductors, especially from Europe into the US. Um, we had a guest conductor from South America earlier that there's no, you know, other than Brazil, there aren't restrictions for people coming in from, from South America. So, um, you know, it just kind of depends. And we've given up trying to figure it out logically. We just know where to look for the rules and we follow the rules. Um, some of the pieces have been suggested by uh, members of the orchestra, especially pieces that we did um, during the summer and earlier in the fall when we were when we were really working with smaller ensembles there were some great wind pieces that we programmed Stravinsky, Mozart, um, uh, uh, great chamber pieces we did the Schubert Octet which I know was a 
you know, a long held enthusiasm of, of several of the musicians to do that piece. Um, we had a great week that was devoted to pieces uh, by women composers, sort of smaller chamber pieces. And again, those pieces were, some of those pieces were suggested by our musicians. And really it's just every, every we, we do still have uh, uh, a staff that is working on this and we've had to reprogram pretty much every week of the entire season um, to adhere to the social distancing guidelines because things like Mahler symphonies, the big Stravinsky ballets, you know, uh, uh, even, even things with three trombones and a tuba in the orchestra, we, we just can't fit on the stage. So really we're, we're um, you know, looking at Haydn symphonies, Mozart symphonies, Beethoven symphonies, early Schubert, and then things that are for kind of chamber orchestra from throughout the repertoire. We can fit 35, 40 musicians on stage, all told. Yeah, so what I noticed, I've been reading about the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, they're already losing musicians um, because they haven't been paid at all. 10% have retired and others have had to move out of New York because the rent is so high there. So I'm not sure about the actual dollars and cents this year, but I think one thing the Houston Symphony is doing is preserving the cohesiveness of the orchestra. If anything, you're enhancing the skills because of all the chamber playing and use of, uh, of symphony musicians as soloists often. And so I think that's gonna turn out to have been an excellent decision. Also, I don't have them here, but could you maybe give a nod to uh, Brad Sales and anyone else who's doing the tech for the symphony? for the live streaming. Yeah, so we have a huge team of people. Huge isn't the right word. We have we have an appropriately sized team of people doing the live streaming. Um, you know, we, we use a combination of, of live operated and robotic cameras. And so there is a little production suite downstairs where uh, I think we've got three people working on the robotic cameras plus a score reader and a director. And the director is, his name's Nick DeFonzo. And he's done a terrific job. Um, some of these people were people that if you've come to our POPs performances in the past, you know that we do live image magnification using three cameras. Um, we have more cameras now, but the, 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 the core of the team that we're using for the live streams was the group of people that we used for those uh, live image magnification, uh, uh, that, that work during our POPs concerts. So we've expanded that team a little bit. And Brad Sales is the audio engineer, and we've we've moved uh, we've moved the 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 audio focus from being recording for radio broadcast to being recording for live stream. And it is a different type of recording because you you need the the balance to match the visual environment that you're experiencing. You need to be able to hear what you see, and so. Uh, you know, Brad has to has to balance in a different way than he would for making a radio or a CD type recording. Um, so everybody has kind of accelerated their learning quickly. And, and I think we're putting out a, a really excellent product. I mean, I look at what a lot of other orchestras are doing. And, you know, we're, we're, we're right in there with the with the, uh, you know, the best in terms of the quality of the live stream, the video and the audio. So I would agree on that. At the end of our presentation, I have the Prague, the last move of the Prague Symphony, so that people can see the camera work and listen to the. Well, that's, that's, a, that's an old one. I mean, that's, it's only gotten better since August when we did that. I, actually, I, I think I would agree. The, the camera work has become more sophisticated. I chose that just because it's ha it's a little bit larger orchestra. There are very few that are posted on YouTube. Um, most of yours, the link disappears in 24 hours. That's so right. I just went with what I could find on YouTube. But I would agree the camera work is much more sophisticated. Uh, when you had a soloist, I, I think both I and past the musician Carol Slocum both felt like we were sitting in Yafin Bronfman's lap. Um, you really felt like you were with the pianist uh, playing the Beethoven uh, Concerto Number no. 3. And uh, there was interesting camera work, such as directly overhead during the eight timpani concerto, which was absolutely fascinating. So we certainly appreciate that. It might be, as if you live stream later on, as more people are in the hall, that even the same people who come to the hall might want to see some of these concerts later on with the camera work. 
Yeah, and that's that's really interesting. We're we're thinking about a package where if you bought an in-person subscription, you would get access to the live stream for a certain window of time after you come to the concert. So we're looking at that for next season because we have actually seen people who currently are coming in person and also watching the live stream, you know, on 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 Sunday after they've come on a Friday or Saturday. Yeah, fantastic. At this point, I'd like to ask Mike Gorman how this has affected your job. I mean, clearly it's turned it upside down, but for instance, this week, I chose this week for your program because originally it was going to be a week off and I thought it might be a low stress time, uh, but instead you have a rather high powered subscription this weekend. So Mike, if you're there, can you talk a little bit about um, how little lead time you have or how much lead time you have for figuring out which musicians are going to play and have you had to suddenly hire someone due to illness, whether it's COVID or anything else uh, during this time? Well, um, so uh, things have kind of progressed since we started, uh, I believe our first uh, public performance during the pandemic was July 4th for a, a televised special uh, called uh, Freedom Over Texas. And we kind of jumped in with both feet because they wanted a, a you know, a, a fair sized orchestra for that. <clears throat> and it really challenged us to find a way to get everyone on stage following the uh, scientific guidelines and uh, uh, having uh, social distancing. And, and it was a kind of a scary time uh, at the beginning because uh, you know, there was a lot that uh, wasn't known at that time about the pandemic, uh, about the virus uh, transmission and everything. And I have to credit uh, all the musicians and everyone you know who participates in um, <clears throat> producing the concerts, uh, you know the backstage bubble we refer to it, uh, uh, you know for kind of uh, you know for their bravery and and wanting to uh, get the music uh, going again. And uh, fortunately, you know we had uh, um, exceptional help, uh, as J John mentioned, from Houston Methodist in helping us. Uh, advising us so that we could craft a set of protocols uh, whereby everyone uh, had reasonable assurance that they, you know, they would be safe in the workplace. So some of the things that impact me in executing those protocols is we no longer let everyone enter the, the backstage area through one door to prevent, you know, uh, <clears throat> crowding. So we have we have uh, three doors uh, for larger concerts and those all have to be staffed by someone who will ask each musician entering, have you done your self-assessment today? Do you have any symptoms? Is your temperature normal? And only when we get the correct responses to that do we let people in the building. So that's, that's a half hour, uh, arri uh, we specify the arrival time window so they can't just uh, you know, they can't come an hour before, they can't come 10 minutes before, it has to be a half hour uh, starting um, 45 minutes before the service. And they have a, an assigned door. So that's three people for a half hour for every single service that we have. So it, this is, you know, it's a labor intensive uh, uh, practice, um, just executing the protocols and of course, all the warm-up spaces have to be carefully assigned. Uh, each musician, uh, I think they're going to have a hard time after the pandemic getting used to the fact that they don't have their own individual table to uncase on. Uh, but now everyone has their own table. They're spread throughout the building. And we have to think very carefully about the flow of uh, you know, traffic patterns backstage. Especially at the beginning, we were trying to separate groups that weren't playing together and uh, physically locate them in different parts of the hall. So there was uh, no chance of cross contamination. We were really thinking about, you know, what, what if someone gets the virus and they're, you know, they're in this, uh, they're playing a string quartet, will the other groups be isolated from them so they can go ahead and perform the concert? Um, so those are a lot of considerations. In terms of uh, hiring musicians, uh, that's one thing I've had a real break from. Normally we employ a lot of substitute and extra musicians in the orchestra. Uh, so my, my brief during the pandemic here is to employ no substitute musicians. Uh, we're, we're currently uh, you know, staffing everything within the resources of the orchestra. And uh, you know, that's not so hard when you're doing Mozart sized 
uh, groups, but it, you know, you have to think very carefully about what you program. Uh, I have hired some saxophone players, uh, a few rhythm section players for um, um, uh, pops concerts, th that sort of thing, uh, instruments that we don't have in the orchestra. But other than that, we're covering everything within, uh, with, within our contracted um, uh, core of musicians. Uh, one, one thing that's important is to make sure that whenever we staff a concert, that we have people that are um, uh, on call and ready to step in if someone is uh, incapacitated in some way. And, um, you know, not just if they fall ill, but if they, you know, um, uh, cut their finger or uh, uh, in anything like that. Uh, and those people have to be tested. We do have a testing reg regimen wherein everyone who is performing during the week's concert, we'll get a COVID test at the beginning of the week so that we have the results before everyone comes in. So we have to think ahead, you know, who might we need to play to step in and those on-call players also have to be tested. Um, so it's, you know, it's uh, kind of reduces our flexibility uh, a great deal in terms of um, uh, what we can do at the last minute. Um, but yeah, we have had, we've had a few hairy situations where, you know, someone will, you know, have like a couple degrees fever and, you know, that's, we, we can't let them come in. Uh, so, you know, we have to kind of scramble and get someone else on stage. But uh, uh, fortunately, the, it, it's proved to be, our, our uh, protocols have proved to be very successful. It's been a very, very safe workplace. Our testing positivity rate is, uh, extremely low, it's a fraction of 1%. So uh, uh, I think that's given everyone a lot of confidence um, uh, as we've gone along and gotten more used to these uh, circumstances. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, we also have several musicians here, three of whom are on the orchestra committee and they would be negotiating with the management about how to proceed this year so I'd love to hear from uh, Martha and Brad and Kate uh, about that uh, procedure. I know that there's had to be some pay adjustments. Uh, was it difficult? Um, was a difficult decision deciding how to proceed from the musician standpoint? And um, and then after that, and Nancy, please feel free to weigh in also from your your uh, point of view. And after that, we're going to ask you about your experience playing in masks. Um, Dropping spit on the prop in the proper places, all of those types of types of things, which are have become so much more complicated than they used to be. Um, so maybe Martha and Brad and Kate, if you could talk a little bit from the orchestra committee perspective right now, please feel free to unmute. Uh, Martha, maybe you could start off. Brad is also on the negotiating committee. So this year we kind of combined the negotiating committee and the orchestra committee to meet once a week with the management and discuss things like, you know, how many people watch the live stream, how many people were in the hall or allowed to be in the hall as it changed. Um, and also we've constantly kept open any questions anyone has about safety protocols um, as questions come up or things change and, and then management talks to people from Methodist. So we're always on top of that. I have to say, I feel really safe um, from the beginning. I mean, the first day going in was kind of nervous, didn't know what to expect, but I feel very safe there because everything's so strict and um, that's really nice atmosphere to be in. Brad, maybe you could talk about um, the the fact that some, some of the instruments play maybe more rarely because of the, of the um, repertoire, how often do you as a trombone player get to play? And I'm assuming everyone is paid the same this year, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. It was always uh, across the board um, whenever we were talking about any sort of compensation thing. But yes, you are correct. Being a trombone player, <laughs> We're, we're a rare, we're an albino zebra at this point. Um, we're really not around the hall very often. Sad to say, um, it's nice when we do come around and 
the programming, they've, you know, they really tried to include the trombones as much as they can, but just, you know, a lot of chamber music does not call for trombones. Um, I was very happy to do Beethoven six a couple of weeks ago. And uh, especially considering that uh, with Alan, you know, he's, he's retiring this year. Um, that's not a secret. So I, I knew that was the last time we were going to be doing that ever um, together, which, and he sounds so good on that, that that was a lot of fun. So those, those moments were really treasuring uh, those opportunities at this point. I'm, I'm counting on my one hand, basically how many meaningful things I'm going to do with him before he's gone, you know, in just a few months. Um, and when Mike was referring to somebody with a, with a fever, that was me actually on one week that I was looking forward to doing some pop stuff. It was, again, it was just going to be me and Alan. Um, for those who don't know, Alan's been our principal trombone for 43 years. Um, very long time. My entire career has been next to him. Um, so, but yeah, I had a fever on the very first day. And so I couldn't come in and we didn't actually have a, a designated uh, alternate that week. Um, just, you know, they would have needed to have taken the, the COVID test earlier in that week. And so we didn't actually have that. So Alan ended up playing that week um, by himself, sadly. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've been doing a lot of hobbies and things from home, obviously a lot of committee stuff, although that has, that has calmed down a bit. At the very beginning, we really were talking and meeting all the time because we were just trying to figure out if we could do this. I mean, we were trying to figure out um, how bad the finances were going to be. We were trying to figure out if, you know, can we play with bell covers? Can we play in some little tent kind of thing? And each person being that tent, we were, we were really brainstorming for a while. Um, there were just a lot of unknowns. And, and uh, so we, we were meeting very regularly and that has continued. It's kind of hard to believe it's, it's been a year. Um, but we've been doing that weekly for a while. Um, the money, the money thing, uh, was not too terribly difficult because it was pretty obvious, uh, the severity of the situation we were in pretty early on. Um, and, uh, so that there, there wasn't a whole lot of talk about that actually. <laughs> Mostly it was, it was about, at-risk musicians. Um, that was something that was really difficult. Um, you know, when players, obviously when we're playing, we're taking breaths without a mask, right? String players could leave a mask on. And that was something we talked about. Should they, and I, and, and I want to say that when we initially started, maybe around the 4th of July, we, we, we were doing the six foot spacing, but not necessarily playing with the mask all the time. I think for the string players, I, I could be wrong about that, but then we did go to okay, we're just, we're going to wear masks all the time, except when absolutely necessary. And so then it got to where, you know, when players were hanging a mask on one ear, initially I was hanging it on a ear. A lot of us were doing that. And as soon as we're done playing, just whip it right back on. Now, now we put it on a little, a little stand. Um, but trying to figure this all out at the very beginning was pretty tough. I remember, uh, lighting a candle this is my own stupid silly little experiment blowing it out you know and you had a little bit of uh smoke there and playing up against that see if i can get it to even move because I, I really didn't know how much air was actually moving out of the end of the bell and actually to my surprise it was far less than um i thought my initial guess um and then the uh the rice studies have, have shown that to be largely very true and Mostly it's the uh, wind movement in the space itself and the filtration and, and that kind of thing, which is most important. But, um, <clears throat> and then also we were really unsure, you know, Mike was talking about well, what if somebody got sick? And so we had to take, you know, a, an entire piece off the program because we considered all those people to have been uh, at risk if somebody came down with COVID. But I've been amazed at how few positive cases we've had, if any, amongst the musicians. It's, it's really been remarkable. Um, the, uh, the musicians have been very safe through this whole thing. And, and um, so this, this issue really hasn't, I mean, to, to my knowledge, really hasn't come up at all in terms of a musician coming down with COVID in, in the middle of a week or, or something like that. So 
Um, so at the very beginning, it was, um, it, it felt a bit, not chaotic, but I mean, just there was a lot of activity because there were a lot of orchestras that sort of thought, well, we're done and we're not gonna be able to do anything for a very, very, very long time and really just shut it everything down. And I don't mean performance wise, I mean, even talking about things, everybody sort of went to their, their little corner uh, but we didn't do that. Um, we, we were talking through this whole thing and we all sort of had the attitude that, well, we're, we're going to make this work, you know, some kind of way we, we can do this, <laughs> whether, whether somebody does, like I said, walk in with their own personal little tent and play from the tent. We, we, we were going to make it work some kind of way, even, even if it got a bit ridiculous, we were going to make it work and we were going to do it safely. And I think that was sort of the attitude from the very beginning. Um, but yes, as, as a trombonist, I'm, I'm not seeing my colleagues nearly as often as I would like to. And when I do get down to the hall, it, it, it definitely feels special. Yes, and hopefully things will get back to normal soon. Actually, one question is, I'm assuming everybody just has to be in their 1A, 1B, 1C, according to your age and your health. Um, I mean, is there any, there's no fast tracking of vaccines at this point, but it looks like perhaps everybody would be eligible by the end of this season so that things might be different as far as vaccination rate for next season. Has that been talked about at all, how that might affect um, both your audience and the players? A lot of players have been able, like uh, a lot of younger players signed up to be volunteers at a vaccine site. And by being a volunteer, they got the vaccine. And then a lot of our players that teach are considered educators. So there've been more opportunities, I think, sooner than we first thought there would be. Cool. At this point, um, I would like to ask Nancy and Kate to talk about the aerosol studies and I guess the experience of being a wind player in the Houston Symphony, which we heard some from Brad about also. Um, yeah, similar to Brad, you know, there hasn't been a, a ton of need for piccolo this year. So anytime I get to play anything on piccolo, like like Beethoven's Six actually has a, a tiny bit of piccolo, I get very excited. Um, but luckily, you know, my, my section, my flute section is very uh, equitable and we always try to like share, make sure we're kind of all playing the same amount. So I've been playing quite a lot of second flute this year more than I normally do, which has actually been really fun for me because I love to play flute also. Um, but yeah, uh, the right study, it was you know, really, really cool to be a part of that. Um, especially kind of uh, the, the first phase of it was back in the summer when I wasn't playing as much. And so I felt like, you know, okay, this is something I can do that's like contributing, um, you know, and not just to, to our orchestra, but to, you know, orchestras all over the country are, are looking at the study and, and a few of the other studies that have been done to see what they can do safely. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a neat experience. And um, so I went to Rice for grad school actually so I got to go back to Rice um, this summer for the study. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it was the actual playing part of it was not much, you know, you, they just would have you play a few notes, you know, they would want different things like, okay, play, play a high loud note, play a low note, play a note where all your fingers are down or, or none of your fingers are down and things like that. And, you know, the most I ever got to play was they said, you know, play, play, you know, a, a lyrical passage. And so I got then that was where I got to like, actually play something musical <laughs> for the study, which was fun. Um, and I played a little bit of the, um, uh, the Carmen Entracht from Bizet. Um, and then, you know, the, the guys doing the study who, you know, none of them are musicians. You know, when I, when I started playing that, they all went, oh, whoa, like that's so pretty. <laughs> um, I think I was the very first, um, candidate if I remember correctly that did the study so that was their first time even like hearing any any of us play something musical <laughs> so um but yeah they were all really really nice um like very friendly guys and, and it was great to work with them and then we did the second phase of the study um I think in November and that was at Jones Hall um and that was kind of amazing to see they they put together this um you know, giant thing that covered like like an entire wall of Jones Hall, which is huge. Um, of it looks like those like QR codes thing <laughs> things with like black and white in like different shapes. Um, and so I guess you know you play in front of that, and then it allows them to kind of see the aerosols. And so 
it was, it was ba we basically played the same little excerpts that we'd played that summer, um, but they wanted us to do it in two positions and they would move the giant wall um, so that they could see you like playing from the front and then from the side. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, it was really cool to be a part of. And um, you or Nancy, can you talk a little bit about uh, the findings of the study? Uh, Nancy, did, you, did they find anything different about French horn versus piccolo? Or once something comes out of the instrument, does it all go the same place? I don't know exactly about the findings. I think I suspect that the, what I understand is that the air, more air comes out around your face than around your bell, and it goes up. So I think what that's my understanding is that it goes up more than it goes out. I think but, that was the finding for um, for basically all the instruments was that none of it is going very far out. Like we hear this thing about um, you know six feet for when you're talking to somebody, but I guess when you're playing into your instrument, you know, the instrument is catching a lot of, you know, everything. <laughs> so uh, it's not going as far and it's, it's, um, and it's warm air too. Generally you're blowing warm air into your instrument. So it's, it's rising. Um, I think flute was the one where it went the farthest of any instrument, but it was at a very low volume. If I remember trumpet was the one that had the highest volume. Um, and so, you know, when we saw that the flute players all were like, you know, see, we're not the worst instrument, you know, because people had been making a lot of jokes about how we were the most dangerous in the orchestra. And um, can someone comment about uh, the ventilation system in Jones Hall? Maybe John again, or I heard from Martha that there may have been some modifications made based on these studies. Sure, I'm happy to tackle that one. Um, as Catherine was saying, the, the warm air, it, it rises. And that was one of the, the sort of eye-opening findings of the study was that the droplet displacement and the movement of the aerosols is dependent on the uh, air handling system in a given space. So that's why after the initial tests in the summer, which took place at Rice, uh, the team came out and did tests on stage at Jones Hall, and they also tested in our rehearsal room downstairs, which we were using as a warm-up area for smaller groups of musicians um, to see what impact the air handling system had on the movement. And um, they're actually uh, uh, in a process of finalizing all of the information that they got from those studies that took place kind of just before the holidays. Um, but you know they've reaffirmed that the six feet is safe, and and I think actually they have some thoughts on on uh, smaller distances being safe for certain instruments. But uh, their recommendations around the air handling system was that it change out the air in Jones Hall a minimum of six times an hour, and we we uh, measured it and and at its kind of normal operation. Uh, it does it about eight times an hour if we turn it on kind of full blast, which given the age of the system and the age of the building is probably not advisable. We think we could get up to 12 to 14 times an hour, but um, you know, we're well within the recommendation. And then they uh, put in hospital grade uh, HEPA filters that are rated MERV 13. That was the recommendation that they gave us. So. Uh, we worked with the city to get that done because, again, the building is owned by the city and operated by this Houston First Corporation nonprofit wing of the city. Um, and then the other thing that was a recommendation was the using of the UVC lights. And, uh, you know, more modern buildings have UVC systems in their air handling systems. So, actually, inside the ductwork, there's UVC lights that burn you know, viruses and other nasty particles. Um, we bought uh, UVC lights that we place around the hall overnight on stage and out in the audience areas. And just people have to stay out of the, the hall while those are, those are on. And, and that's, that's kind of a, the, the fix for older buildings until they decide to completely replace the air handling system in Jones Hall. Um, that was the the recommended fix. So those are the changes we made. 
So at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. I am now allowing the audience to unmute yourself. I might ask the first one. Um, I'd like to hear from Martha and maybe one of the wind players about the experience of playing in masks, what the temperature is like in, on stage. Is it, um, it's sort of an aerobic thing to play a Beethoven symphony and how difficult is that to do while wearing a mask? Well, at first there was a little bit of panic, like, I think, what if I faint on stage? I don't think I can breathe. And then you're just so busy playing that and focusing, you kind of forget about it. But it is feels warmer to me than usual, especially on the live stream when there's the big lights on you. Um, but again, if for safety reasons, it's, it's fine. You know, I feel good that we are doing it. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's a little warm, but we're adjusting to that part of it. Yeah, thanks. I, there's no diminishment and quality of the music as far as we can see. For the wind players, since you have, everything's about breath, if, are you wearing your masks in between playing? It sounds like you might be. And does that affect how you feel when it's time to start playing? Um, yeah, it's uh, so we're we're always putting our masks back on when we're not playing. Um, you know, I think that it becomes a judgment call sometimes when you're playing a piece and you're like, okay, I have twenty bars of rest. Is that long enough to put it back on and and take it off, or like, is it not worth it at that point? And so, um, it's kind of up to us to to police ourselves in, in doing that. But um, you know, it's just I think the trickiest part about it is just kind of yeah, make, making those little judgment calls of like, okay, when is a long enough rest to put it back on? And also like making sure that you keep counting your rest in your head while you're fiddling with your, your mask. Uh, for me, that's the trickiest part. I was gonna say, I agree with that, but it's it's logistically, you know, you got two hands holding your instrument and then you gotta have, you know, figure out logistically how to get the thing on and off. But for me, the big, the hardest part is my glasses. You know, they fog up. You put the thing on where it goes, and then the glasses fog up. You can't see anything, and you got to kind of deal with all that. But and then actually, when you take it off the mask, it's like, yes, I can breathe. So it's, I don't appreciate. I mean, I appreciate the string players having to play with their mask on, but it, for us, it's just a logistical dealing with everything. Occasionally, I've gone grocery shopping with, with my glasses, and I'm like, now I see the problem. I did read that there's actually a fix for that. Something about using soapy water on your glasses um, might, might read up on that, but I, you also need to be able to see very well, so we'd have to make sure that that, that doesn't interfere. We have just a few more minutes. Uh, I hope some of the musicians can stay a little bit longer, but John and, and uh, Mike will have to leave pretty soon, so if anyone else has a question, please go ahead. Hi, Steve. Hey, um, was there any was there any consideration given to um, alternate venue um, meaning out of doors? So um, we did talk with Miller uh, Miller Outdoor Theater uh, early on. Um, there were a couple of issues there. One, the backstage support area was not really large enough for us to I see. I understand. Let me interrupt. Oh. Um, um, my, my thoughts are along the lines of, um, was there any thought given to operating sort of like a mobile army surgical hospital or mass unit? You, you find an open field, uh, you move your equipment in, you give your concert and you move out. Yeah, we didn't think of that just because of the expense of you know, building a whole stage and amplified sound and all the kinds of things that we would we would want to do. Um, right. So if 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 that if that had been an an initial process, that might be online by now. Do you think? Uh, if we if we'd started doing that, yes. But it was just much easier to use the building we already have. Yes. Yes. I see. Well, and and. Yeah, there are long-term commitments involved there for lots and lots of people. Yes, with the with the venue. Yeah, so it was it was a good way to you know also the using Jones Hall means that not only could we do the concerts but we 
you know, kept all our stagehands employed. We kept the ushers yes, employed. Yes. You know, there was Precisely. a lot of benefit. Yeah, I, I hadn't considered that. Yeah, the roots are very deep there um, on city venues. Um, uh, but one of the things that uh, the freelance musicians uh, uh, around town have considered is uh, is a lot more outdoor activity and doing that in, in small groups too has been has proven quite effective for some people. Yeah, I saw there was a concert in Levy Park that or Levy Park that uh, uh, I can't remember if it was uh, Ars Lyric or De Camera did maybe a week ago and the opera studio, uh, you know, people have done, I think they did like a Rossini sacred work and yeah. I, I personally, I, I experienced Levy Park myself, and it, it's very good for the eyes, but it's, it is, if you are seeking to um, meditate in the noisiest spot in Houston, Texas, go to Levy Park, uh, because it's a canyon of high rises next to a freeway, and yeah. it's, it's, like, it's like a freeway megaphone over there, but it sure takes nice pictures. <laughs> Steve, you've been watching too much Mozart in the Jungle. Um, <laughs> Why is that? that? Well, that conductor, there's some amazing outdoor concert scenes. Martha, oh, is that quite, right? Yes, yes. Actually, I'm quite amazing when they do that. But logistically, it's difficult. And this actually allowed the musicians to work on a very consistent basis. Martha, did you have something to say? Um, it, as you can tell from all of us, it's been such a gift to play. And we were so happy from the beginning that we could do it. And I, I just wanted to tell you the first time, I think it was the first or second, it must have been the first time when we went for the PCR test, which the uh, people from Methodist come down to the hall to test us and it's a nasal swab. And it was kind of scary at first And we thought, oh my gosh, how, how can we possibly do this week after week? But um, we do, so we can play. But that first time, and we hadn't seen each other for so long, and they were trying to keep us separated, and the appointment separated, but you turned around and you saw people, and in short time, there was about a circle of eight of us just kind of standing there, staring at each other. How are you? How are you? And normally, after rehearsal, it's kind of like people are out of there. I got to teach, or I got to pick up the kids, or, you know, I got to do whatever but we just kind of lingered and looked at each other didn't have a lot to say except how are you and it was really special and you realize how much of a connection we have with each other from doing this and um it's really been a gift to be back there but i have to say those first concerts with no one in the hall to stand up all dressed up we've played a concert and hear no clapping. It was rather eerie. Yeah, that's that's a weird thing. We have the same problem here at the Tuesday Musical Club. Wonderful performances and no clapping, just a few thumbs up. At this point, I'd like to thank everybody for being here who came to speak, John and Mike and Nancy, Kate, uh, Martha and Brad. And if any of you have time to stay on, I'm going to start music with actually a clip from the Houston Symphony. And John's right, the, uh, the camera work has become more sophisticated since, but even back then, you can see there's great attention paid to putting the camera on the people you need to see. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and my sound.
As you can see, the symphony is sounding fabulous, even indoors. I would like to invite Rada Buchmann to introduce uh, her piece. I'm going to go ahead and get it uh, ready to share next. The very short piano prelude. Okay, this is a prelude in G major by Rachmaninoff, and uh, this prelude was very special to him. He loved to perform it, unlike another prelude, which is very famous and. Everyone demanded it, and he did like this prelude, but G major he performed through his life, and uh, he composed it in 1910 in Ivanovka, and this piece, I think, was very nostalgic for him. Actually, nostalgic for me, too, because I learned it when I was 17, and it was my last year in Russia.
I'm going to go ahead and get Stephen Perkins videos ready. He should be online. He just had his cello lesson at Yale. And he definitely has a symphony connection because his uh, high school teacher during his high school years for cello was Chris French. And his teacher for undergraduate work was Desmond Hovig, who's a former principal cellist of the symphony. Stephen, if you want to go ahead and, and talk about your pieces a little bit, he's going to be playing with his mother, Jane Perkins, who's a wonderful pianist and member of the Houston Tuesday Musical Club. And I'm going to ask Stephen to unmute, and I'll be going ahead and getting your first clip ready, which will be the Foray Sicilian. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Stephen Perkins, as she uh, mentioned. So um, these pieces are actually from a project that I was doing over the summer, which I called um, Thing a Week, where for a few months, I would, my, my mom and I, for the most part, I think there was one where I played a, a solo piece, but every week I would start working on uh, a short piece for cello, for cello and piano. And by the end of the week, no matter what, uh, how it progressed or anything, I would record it and uh, upload it online. Um, so these are, I think there are three pieces from, uh, from this project. One, the Foray Sicilian, and then two movements from a not so played suite by um, Arensky. <laughs>
was Stephen. That was fabulous. It was so fabulous. The first few times I watched this, I forgot to notice your socks in the Arensky. The it, wonderful playing. I hear a lot of Desmond in there actually. So what I'm going to do now, because we don't really get to applaud, is I'm going to ask Roy to officially end the meeting, and then I'm going to let it run for a little bit and allow people to unmute in case you want have any comments or just want to speak among yourselves. So I'd like to invite Roy Wiley, one of our presidents, to uh, end the meeting, please. Thank you, Debbie. I'll applaud for everybody. I know everybody wants to. That was just a marvelous program. Um, finding out how musicians dealt with the, what we're all dealing with in our own ways. Uh, and they were very successful about it and very careful. And that's what we're all trying to do. Thank you uh, again. Um, I just want to announce that we did have our big competition for child prodigies over this weekend. And uh, the, all those results will be coming out to you soon. So it was, a, it was held online and uh, we had great judges and marvelous performers. And we'll hope to figure out how to some way get our winners uh, presented uh, to you at some point. Thank you again, Debbie and Gail, all the members of the Houston Symphony. We'd love hearing you talk and especially play. So we hope you get back to doing that more often.